I'm Jim Tech. You're watching Kelowna Now. I'm here with Bruce Rose uh, from AP Group or Aspen Planers in, in Merritt, the mill that recently closed. Thank you for taking your time with us today, Bruce. Yeah, th thanks, Jim. Thanks for your interest. Maybe can you give us a little bit of background on what's going on? Because I, I got from, I did an interview with Dan Elvis yesterday, the MP for that area. And yeah. he was saying that there was a promise that was made back when John Horgan was uh, the premier that they would never close a mill. They would support that. They would never close a mill in Merritt. So. Well, I, you know, I, 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 I'm not, I'm not familiar and can't speak to, you know, and I don't recall the, the comments that the, the former premier made, but, uh, you know, we've just been in a situation where, um, you know, as I've been quoted previously, the, you know, the market realities of where we're at in British Columbia in terms of, uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, log prices, access to logs, uh, which is related to access to getting cutting permits, uh, and all those things um, relative to the, the pricing of lumber products, just, uh, it, it, you know, we just can't make a go of it, just, you know, significant uh, monthly losses. So for now, we've, uh, you know, we've closed, we've closed down our Merritt sawmill. So we still have other facilities in the southern interior. We, we operate a specialty panel plant in, um, in uh, Savannah on Kamloops Lake, and we have an associated veneer plant over in, in, uh, in Lillooet. So we're, uh, and we have a biomass burning energy plant in Merritt as well. So we're still, uh, you know, very active in the forest products business in the interior, as well as a lot of activity uh, in, on the coast in our, uh, in our Western Red Cedar business. So you are a BC based company and uh, Merritt yeah. is, is an operation that ended up losing a hundred jobs. Is that, is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's there, there's roughly a hundred jobs, uh, direct jobs affected uh, at the Merritt at the Merritt sawmill. And uh, yes, we we do have Jim. Just for some background, and pardon me if you're already familiar with this, but the the we're a privately owned, family owned uh, company, the AP Group, and uh, our uh, CEO's uh, father started the business actually in the Nicola Valley in North Thompson regions back in the late 1940s. So we've been operating in the southern interior on the coast for over, <clears throat> by now, I guess, for, you know, roughly 75 years. So we're really, obviously, this is a, Merritt was the, the, the original uh, fixed sawmill. Um, Surrender, uh, Gog's father actually ran portable sawmills prior to that. But we, uh, you know, that is the base of the, the original base of, uh, of Aspen planers is, is in Merritt. So this is why this is such a difficult situation for us, because it, it is, uh, you know, it is the company's uh, community, original community. So we also had some information from, from Canfor, and they're saying it's access to fiber, the regulations, and just the time delays on everything. Is that kind of like the same thing you're facing? Yes, I just echo, I echo the same thing. I think, you know, some of the press releases that came out from, um, you know, from Don Kane at Canfor and others, you know, there's not a lot I, not a lot I could add to that. Yeah, so then I did speak with the forest minister, Bruce Ralston, but he said it's not the case that there is the timber has been provided and that it's really just the interest rates and the market conditions that's forcing these closures. And I said, well, there's a big discrepancy between what Canfor is saying, what Aspen Planer is saying, and what, what you're saying. Well, I guess I'd put it this way, Jim, just looking at the, the facts of the matter independent of, I guess, of who said what. Um, just look next door in Alberta. I guess, um, you know, they have a forest industry, probably probably about 60% of the size or so of British Columbia at this juncture, 60 to 70% of the size throughout all this period of time. Well, BC's lost, I don't know, pick a number that analysts report, maybe 10,000 jobs over the last, you know, short few years. Alberta has uh, essentially been uh, booming and going 100%. So, as far as I know, they, they you know they're selling into the same markets. Uh, I don't think they have their own interest rates in Alberta. They may wish yeah. they they did, but they don't. <laughs> so I, I I guess those are the facts. Those are the facts of the matter. So I, yeah. I, I, I well, I, Linda I, Cody said a hundred ten thousand jobs in the last year in a sector, the second largest sector in British Columbia, that's now at ninety thousand jobs. Um, and I worked in that that sawmill industry as a as a youngster too, and 
And, uh, and I know that the people that have those jobs are good paying jobs where you buy, you know, you buy a house with it and you, and you build a family. And the tough part for the people in Houston and Merritt and all those places, it's tough to replace those good paying jobs. And what do you do with your house, like in Houston and, and Great Bear Lake and all those places when, you know, the, the, the biggest source of economic activity is, is closed? Well, well, exactly. I mean, the, you know, these jobs are, you know, pick a number, you know, with benefits. These are 80, 90, 100,000, 100, you know, $10,000 a year jobs that, uh, as you say, Jim, are family supporting jobs. There are there are rare alternative opportunities in these communities. You've named a number of them. Look at a place like Fraser Lake. Obviously, you know, the mill essentially was, you know, the town. And, um, you know, I believe it's West Fraser closed uh, that mill down. And, you know, I, I know we hear all sorts of messages from the government about, you know, trend, forestry transition and community transition programs. But, you know, those things don't do anything to help replace the type of, uh, you know, the type of income and the effects, you know, the economic opportunities. There aren't other similar economic opportunities. And, yeah, and a lot really, of the guys, I mean, I, when I worked there, my brother, like 40 years in the, in the mill industry, I mean, a lot of those guys, they stay for, you know, like that's their, their lifelong career. And it's not a, like an easily transferable skill, right? I mean, they, they have a certain skill set that uh, kind of works for what they do and, and they make good money at it, right? But um, tough to replace, as you just said. Yeah. And, and Jim, I think the part that, you know, it's very evident in, you know, the communities we operate in, as, as I said, you know, over in Lillowood as well, we're the largest employer over in that part of the uh, part of the world and, you know, with 100 plus direct jobs over there as well. And the difficulty and the really sad part of it all is the social effects of all these jobs gone away. Like, forget the economic pieces aside from that, but the social ills and social uh, impact in the communities is is very evident, and it, it's a very, very difficult situation. So we've interviewed quite a few people. We've interviewed uh, the, the op- BC opposition, uh, Kevin Falcon, and he said the NDP has turned its back on the forestry sector. And that, and then John Rusted, the leader of the BC Conservative Party, said it's just it's just tragic and it's just a mess and it has to be completely redone, and uh, to support the forestry sector. And then yet yet the message doesn't seem to be ringing through to the NDP. Well, yeah, I, you know, and I, I, I listened to some of um, I listened to some of the interviews you had you had earlier. I could echo some of those comments, and I'm not going to wade into the, you know, the political environment right. of the, the whole issue. But I mean, none of this is any good for anybody. Um, you know, what, what what starts to concern concern me, and you know, I read a piece the other day from a forest analyst by the name of um, Russ Taylor, who's been around, does global forest products. He actually, you know coined the phrase, which which it really stuck with me, where he said, you know, what's very sad about the number of these job losses and everything associated with it is it almost seems to be coming normalized. And we can't allow these things to become normalized. And, I, you know, I hear all the, you know, the rhetoric about it's a foundational industry. We want it to be a strong industry. We want this. We want that. Uh, you know, I, I, I guess my you know, my my cynical or laughing part of it, sadly, is like, well, it's a good thing, you know, you know, that we don't want it to be a weak industry if this is the outcome of wanting it to be a strong industry. So it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, as I've said in the past, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it has been, it's cratering, pick the word, it's, it's a catastrophe. Yeah. Just I mean, look at the facts, I guess. That's all there is to yeah, look at. Yeah, I got that impression when I was talking to the minister, because again, I had, I do have some empathy for the for the people on the ground there, um, as I was one of them at one time, the to say that it, you know, and I think he said it this way. I'm paraphrasing, but is he said the sad truth is is that you know they're just going to have to find a different job. Um, but a, a lot of these people, it's going to be really hard to find a job that that even comes close to that income level that they've you know grown accustomed to. And, and especially in remote communities like Houston and, and Bear Lake and that, like, where, where are they supposed to find this other job? And what do they do with their house where they've invested their, you know, life savings into? Yeah, and, and, and Jim, on that note, you're, you're bang on. And on that note, you know, if, if, if it was the a rare closure for, you know, let's just say a certain facility was obsolete 
and then there were other you know thriving mills or somewhere else you could shift to and go to but the closures have been so rapid and the job loss so rapid i mean you know if, if you know there are people there's contractors of ours for instance in merit who picked up recently and and in the past and they just go to alberta to work for a while maybe take their logging trucks they you know as they say they're either going to go over there and haul logs and do things or they're going to go to the auction yeah. And uh, so, so you know, this, this once again, back to my point about the social effects and how sad this is in the communities and, you know, the effect on, you know, on just on human beings. This is not good for human beings. And, and I guess I guess I'm I question all the time here is sort of whose interests are being advanced. And I, I kind of I'm always asking myself the same question about, you know, the seeming indifference to the industry. Yeah. So one of the questions I asked too, because like, I think there was that sixty percent of what was supposedly promised for for a cut block, and then one of the questions I asked if wildfire, and it is one of our greatest concerns nowadays, and we had a fire yesterday here in Kelowna. Why aren't we allocating more wood to be cut, and then which would make create some natural fire breaks in that? Like it, it's, it seems to make sense if we if if according to this this current government that climate change is our our biggest threat, then why wouldn't we? allow the forestry industry to cut more wood so that we would build more more fire breaks. Well, exactly, Jim. Um, you know, there are a number of, you know, experts of in, industry analysts, you know, forest experts, uh, people at in forestry, UBC, different schools. You know, they, they, they point out exactly that. And and I'll come back to that. But just your, your comment about, um, as you said, I think uh, Ken Ford mentioned about what they've been able to cut. I, I think in 2023, the um, the amount of cut was only 60 percent of what the annual allowable cut is that's established by the government's own chief forester. So the chief forester said, "Here's the annual allowable cut," and only 60 percent of it was harvested. And yeah, the the wildfire, you know, m- most as a, back to the point about the other experts, they say we do need a lot more active forest management, not a just leave it to itself and let things be approach. We need to be, you know, removing, you know, fuel on the forest floor, et cetera, which cause these, you know, massive, massive wildfires. And I mean, the province owns, um, it, you know, very similar to Canada, all the governments, but the, the you know, the province owns 94% uh, you know, of the forests in, in British Columbia. It's their asset. And I, I'm always surprised that, you know, that, that is a very important asset to theirs. We're very focused uh, at this time. Everybody's hyper-focused on, uh, um, you know, greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the forest fires in the last three or four years have actually dwarfed all other emissions combined. And so you'd think, you know, if you had an asset uh, of, of that value that you, you wanted to manage uh, and you wanted to keep emissions down, you'd have some active forest management to, to uh, you know, along the lines of what you said. There's a number of prescriptions and different ways to go about it. But um, anyways. I, I, yeah, I, the, the podium talk seems to be in direct conflict with the actions, which is sometimes very puzzling. So it's very hard to figure out. But I ask you this. What 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 does the forestry industry need for for Mayor to go back to work for Canfor to, to find? Because I think I I also know that that companies like yourself, it's big capital investments to build a mill and to upgrade a mill and all that kind of stuff. Where, what do you need to get certainty, and what do you need to to make sure that you know if you're going to make an investment and put that mill back online, you can't obviously you can't put it online, take it offline, take it off, and then invest like you know, uh, technology is a big part of what you do. So what do you need? Well, you, you know, you, first and foremost, you need, you know, an adequate and regular supply of economic fiber. Um, the fiber pricing system in British Columbia, in my opinion, is, uh, you know, is obviously completely uh, broken in the face of other competitive jurisdictions that we have to, um, you know, compete with. I'll use it, Alberta again as an example. Right at the moment, the stumpage in Alberta is about $2 a cubic meter. And a lot of the permits we have around the Merritt area, they're in the $30 per cubic meter to $50 per cubic meter range. And so, no, you you didn't, uh, you know, 
I just, just to clarify, I understand it's the highest highest jurisdiction in North America. In North America, yeah. And you know, and and so, and we also, you know, you need you need some cutting. You know, if the timber pricing system is is you know is fixed, then you need some certainty of when you can get on the land base and how you can get on the land base. So you need some you need some policy. Uh, consistency and slowdown of this avalanche of policies that have come out over the last four or five years that just create uh, endless uncertainty. And, you know, and quoting Russ Taylor again on something I read, it is a couple of days ago, he just said, BC has become uninvestable because of the, because of the uncertainty. And, you know, I, and, you know, I, I understand, I go back and look and wonder how we get here, you know, at, at, at times in the past, the, 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 you know, there, public policy by nature, Jim, you've been around, uh, you know, for a long time and assessed all sorts of industries. Public policy by nature is always a matter of trade-offs. Um, this government made a, has made a priority, continues to make a priority out of conservation. And I think even at one point when the cabinet ministers was quoted of, you know, we're going to focus on conservation and we'll see how industry fits in. And you know that that is the issue that 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 we're that we're dealing with, and that's that's exactly you know that's one of the prime reasons with all this uncertainty, whether you can get fiber, whether you can get on the land, even if you have a forest license, you possibly can't get on the land at all for a variety a variety of reasons, conservation reasons, a lot of confusion about the implementation of UN DRIP. And working with um, you, you know with our indigenous partners and other partners, so there's a lot of complications around all these things. So, but those are the key things. It's just getting access to some economic fiber and getting the fiber. Yeah, it doesn't make sense that uh, our neighbors to the east of us there. Um, I think BC is has a larger asset base in, in in forestry than 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 they do, and yet they can do it for a lot cheaper and a lot more efficiently. And, uh, and like you said, they, they keep running. So um, it seems uh, you would think like forestry being the number two industry in British Columbia that we would put more emphasis on it for sure. And, and I think it, it's something that needs to get fixed. Like, like um, most of the, the towns outside the lower mainland or the larger cities are built off of resources, whether that's a, like a, a lumber mill or a, a mine or something like that. They, they don't start... Um, communities in Williams Lake and Merritt just, you know, because they decided that's where we put a house. It's because it's next to a resource that's being actively um, worked. Well, exactly. And, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm constantly shocked about the lack uh, and, and I, and I live in the lower mainland. I'm just shocked generally about the lack of coverage or interest or any stories. And so I appreciate your interest in this story and, uh, on a continuous basis. Uh, it doesn't get any coverage like it doesn't. And, you know, and I understand that's probably part of policy. You know, it, it's 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 relating to urban voters and not rural voters. And I guess if your reference points is, uh, you know, Pacific Spirit Park out by UBC or Stanley Park or Cathedral Grove, uh, you know, there's a strong viewpoint from, you know, uh, mm -hmm. from environmental groups and people in the right. in the urban areas, including some of my neighbors. Uh, we should never cut down a tree. A tree. Down. Trees yeah. are a renewable resource. I mean, maybe it's a, a part of the education that has to happen, maybe from the forest industry itself, because it doesn't seem like the government wants to do it, um, because they are a renewable resource, and it actually stops wildfires, because we have a comparison with Finland, which has young forests, and they have relatively no fires compared to, you know, like Canada. Yeah, well, exactly. And, you know, I, I think the issue, you know, it's very different, on the coast, you have trees, some cases that are hundreds of years old, uh, you know, they grow in the winter. The northern forests and in the interior, and you know, well know this from, from, from working in, uh, in, in, in the industry, um, the trees don't get that old. They don't grow in the winter because it's cold and really old trees uh, either end up getting infested with, you know, Bugs, yeah, pine beetle, uh, all that stuff. Or yeah. Pine beetle. We we saw that academic, or, or um, you know that that yeah. epidemic, or else we you end up having these massive wildfires. Right. Um, and so you know they, they and, and and in that case, all values 
seem to you know get destroyed. It doesn't matter if they're heritage values, uh, biodiversity values, uh, everything else. I mean, you know, just I don't need to explain it to you. I mean, yeah. look at West Kelowna last year. Look at the shoe yeah. swap. Well, I mean, uh, the, the the big difference is on the lower mainland or on the island that it rains all the time, and and they're not really at risk for forest fires. And you know, whereas here we have in the in the winter they don't grow, but they also in the summer they dry out quite well or quite a bit, and they and they're susceptible to wildfires. Yeah, exactly. And as you said, you saw some of it yesterday um, pop up in Peachland. So yeah, yeah it's, it's for Kelowna. It's not a matter of like if it's, it's like when, and same for Merritt, and same for Cash Creek, and same you know like all the areas. Like if we if we don't have active forest management that helps mitigate our our wildfire thing, which is which I would say is one of the biggest threats to the British Columbia outside the Lower Mainland and you know the Victoria and that because of you know they obviously have a very wet climate, right, compared to the rest of us out here. But um, we should be focusing that energy. Like they they say, climate change is number one. Then then why don't we do more with forestry? Well, yeah, Jim and I, you know. Back to your back to your question, you asked a minute ago. But you know what really needs? You're asking what really needs to get done in terms of just merit. When I think of it, what needs to get done in a broader sense, for the benefit of all British Columbians, is we need to have a balanced conversation um, around the issues of environmental issues, economic issues, and social issues. And meaning social issues as in you know caring about you know human beings and how does all this fit so how do we have a balanced conversation and i think when you have the balanced conversation to your point you would focus a lot more on forest stewardship overall and long-term forest stewardship i mean we we don't spend a lot of money for instance on fire prevention i, re I read a thing out of ubc uh, you know a couple of weeks ago it was an old report but i think it picked a period of time from I don't know, 2006 to 2015, where there was about $200 million total spent in that period of time in British Columbia on fire pre uh, prevention work. And yet we spent, you know, billions on fire suppression. Right. Yeah, and no, so that I think seems to be the facts for themselves. Seem, yeah, seems to be the... The other statement that was made by the, the BC minister that they're meeting with the... Uh, the, the people at Aspen Planners on a, on a weekly or monthly basis, on a monthly basis, and they're working through the concerns. I'm just wondering, like, they said they met with Canfor on an ongoing basis, but then, you know, Canfor is saying different things. It seems like they're not attending the same meetings or they're taking away different things. And sometimes when you're in meetings, maybe you're not listening or you're not hearing what the other side's concerns are. But it definitely seems like, to me, like it, there's two different meetings going on, or maybe they're coming and talking at people as opposed to listening. Well, in in respect of um, in terms of meetings with with us in Merit, the, the reference to monthly meetings that the ministry must be referring to, and I, I read their comments about that earlier. Those are meetings that we had requested uh, with our with our local woodlands planning uh, personnel in order to figure out what the roadblocks were on getting cutting permits approved and why the delays. I mean, some of these things go on, you know, I've been quoted in the past as other, some of these things take, you know, they take years, Jim. I mean, it used to be quite, quite prescriptive. And now it seems that, you know, getting a cutting permit is discretionary uh, for a variety of reasons. So those monthly meetings were, were driven by us meeting with, uh, you know, the district manager and others in merit um to talk about working on some of these permit delays so and you know the the district manager and local uh you know the local staff are are helpful but this you know this wasn't talking about the longer bigger term you know you know larger term picture in terms of economic fiber or situations like that this was to just get our cutting permits approved yeah. and i think a lot of people don't understand is like you know when when a company has to make a 200 million billion dollar investment into a into a fiber plant that you know they need some certainty as to what you know because they got to get that money back and also i don't think a lot of people realize when they go to rona or home depot where that wood comes from yeah that's probably that's probably back to my reference point being stanley park and pacific spirit park as the as, as the uh, reference point for for forestry but it's yeah, just, uh, well, 
you do need to get the money back. And I, I think I recall, I don't remember his exact words, but I think Don Kane and Canfor in their press release about not going ahead with Houston, uh, you know, they were just saying, we don't have enough comfort that we're going to be able to recover an investment, you know, in the $200 million range. And, I, you know, I think that that goes for anybody. Yeah, again, if you think that if if climate change is one of our number one priorities, housing is one our number one priorities, doesn't forestry kind of like fit right in the middle of all that, a good forestry management practice where we're, we're harvesting good jobs that you can build homes and all that kind of stuff? It seems like forestry should be part of the solution, not not part of the, the problem. It, absolutely. And also, you know, back to my point about the, you know, being the largest, you know, provincial, you know, BC's largest emitter of greenhouse gases and uh, and air yeah. pollution happens to be the provincial government by the nature of the, of the forest. So the forest, uh, you know, are, are a very, very valuable, you know, carbon sink as well. Um, and so, yeah, it fits right. It fits right in there, Jim. I couldn't agree with you more. So so what's what's uh, this is I think I'll, I'll wrap it up here. What those hundred workers that are that are all not working right now, Merritt, what's their future look like? Are they kind of in limbo? Are they kind of hoping for, for a change in, in some policy or something? Or are they just like figuring their how to move on kind of thing? Uh, a number of them, you know, we've offered them opportunities in some of our other locations. For instance, at, at Savannah, it is a, it is a panel plant, a, a specialty plywood plant, not a lumber mill, but, you know, a lot of them have a number of skills that are uh, applicable. Um, there now it's you know it, it's an hour and change from Merritt living in Merritt to go uh, you know up to Savannah and then back and be a little obviously a bit dicey in the winter time but you yeah. know a number of people have taken up those op- those opportunities uh, other you know we're working with unions and others on on you know some other people doing what we can through the union and and others to help su- to support some of the other workers in in the interim and um, you know I, other people have you know, do make decisions to just move along um, or just decide, I don't want to go through this on again, off again business anymore. And I'm just, you know, I'm going to retire or, uh, or, you know, do whatever. So it, it's a real, it's a real mixed bag, um, you know, at, at this point, Jim. So, uh, so, and you know, the NDP kind of built their base around unions and yet, you know, like what's the union doing for all these job losses and then how, what has their response been? Um, I, you know, they, they, in the case of the local that represents our three interior operations, uh, they're, they're, uh, you know, they voice their concerns, raise their concerns. But I, as I said, I, I don't, they, you know, clearly the facts just speak for themselves. They, they have not, they have not had any more success than we've had or anybody else in the industry has in terms of, as you say, fixing uh, something that's clearly, you know, that's clearly broken. Hmm. Is there anything else you want to add today before we let you go? Well, I guess, Jim, just, you know, back to the issue in merit, not only of our employees, you know, it's very, we, we have a number of contractors in merit uh, who, you know, have actually worked with us and, you know, logging contractors, et cetera, for over 50 years. And, you know, they, that, you know, aligning themselves, working with us, working earlier as well with Tolco when they had a mill in, in Merritt that they closed back in, in 2018. And, you know, there's, we are the last mill in town. There were five mills in Merritt at one period of time. Um, that is the last mill that is there and standing. And now they're, you know, you know, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? Am I going to pack it in? What am I going to do with all my guys? And, you know, and the, the effect, um, you know this stuff well from living in small towns of forest industry. The effect on the tire shop, people, you know, going out for dinner, but, you know, industrial supply yeah. store. Everything, right? Contract, everything. Grocery store, it's restaurant, just, car dealership, yeah. ev- everything, right? Because it's, it's, the, it's the multiplier effect of that money. That $100 gets spent in that community 10 times, right? And it moves yeah. around in that community, you know, from the baker to the, to the tire shop, like you said, to the barber. And, it, and it, when you suck that money out of the community, because I'm sure can, or I'm sorry, uh, Aspen Planners probably contributed. Do you, do you have a number of what, what's economic benefit that it contributed a year? 
Oh, I no, I don't have that readily handy, Jim. It's a good question. <laughs> I'm, I'm next, sure that number is. Next time is, I talk, I should know that. I'll make myself. <laughs> well, I mean, a just note. in wages alone, if you take a hundred times a hundred, right? Do you know what I mean? A hundred yeah. times a hundred thousand. Just just that alone yeah. is huge, right? Do you know what I mean? Like tens yeah. of millions of dollars, right? I'm I'm sure that Aspen Planners, and then you talk about the logging industry, and you talk about all these other spinoff industries. It's probably close to an economic benefit. I'm just going to throw a number out. I'm a CPA as well. I'm going to throw a number out there, and I'm going to say it's like, you know, 250 to 300 to even half a billion dollars of, of, of spinoff money that, that kind of generates out of that economy. And you take that kind of money and suck that right out of that, you know, that small community. It leaves a gaping hole. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, just very, it's just very sad for all of these rural forest-dependent communities are you know it is it's just it's just you know it's it's devastating it's just very sad to see and and the industry it doesn't need to be like this i mean you know in my you know in my opinion i mean it should be a thriving industry as i've said the annual allowable cut is a lot is is you know and the sustainable cut is a lot larger than what is being than what is being harvested what is being logged and all the economic activity um associated with 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 whether you know in our case whether you're Merritt, Savannah, Lillooet, I'm I mean we have endless indigenous uh, partners and employees. You know our our business or our employee makeup is you know replicates the demographics of the communities we operate in, and all these you know these economic opportunities just just vanish, and. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's just a, a very, very sad state of affairs. As I said, just the, the, you know, the humanity aspect of this is just devastating. Well, a little homework for you. I wouldn't mind knowing that number if you can get that from, you know, some of the, the people in your company there to see what that economic benefit or maybe the town has that number. Um, would be good to know. That's the accountant. The accountant in you that's the, needs to know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm saying that that's a pretty, pretty powerful number when you put that in front of somebody and you say like this, this can we do without this, right? Like if you're talking to the mayor and council there, like I think people need to start raising their voices and say, can we afford to lose three hundred million dollars a year? Yeah, yeah. They and I and I do. We do have we do have those numbers, and you know, I, the typical what the uh, you know what the what the province and and others use as far as the multiplier effect in the in yeah. the I mean, like lumber the and logging industry. industry. I'll, I'll get that to you. The industry itself is the second largest industry in British Columbia, and that alone should speak volumes to British Columbians all over the place, right? The amount of tax that thing generates and stuff like that, right? Oh yeah, yeah. No, it's um, yeah. At some at some point, the economic consequences of this need to be addressed, um, you know, for the good of all of British Columbia. Well, it's it's all about the prosperity of all British Columbians that want to have a home and stuff like that and, and want to live a good life, right, and be able to buy the groceries that they need and, and raise the families and all that other stuff, right? Yeah, and, you know, and, you know in, in Merritt and in other communities and other companies I've talked to, you know, that the concern that everybody voices is just, you know, they're in rural BC and they've just, they've just been forgotten about. Yeah. I mean, I would say that that's, that's the case. A lot of places is, is the rural areas just don't get the attention. Right. And then, and it seems like the people that live, I mean, I guess not really slagging on them, but the people that, you know, like ride the bus and go to Stanley park and all that kind of stuff, they just don't see it, don't experience. It. I think maybe we should, we should have just like, you know, like in some countries that make you go in the military, maybe our country should be five years in the North or something like that, where you have to actually experience a mine or a mill or something like that and understand that that cell phone that you use is full of copper, gold, silica, silica, silver, lead, cop, all those things. And, and, and basically, right. you know, that wood builds your home. Right. So. Yeah, it's an inter interesting, it's an interesting thought because, you know, as I, as I say, Jim, just to, I appreciate your interest, you know, in a, in a large community like, uh, you know, like uh, Kelowna these days, because there's, you know, there, there doesn't seem, this doesn't resonate in the lower mainland. And I, I don't, I, I don't suspect it resonates a lot in uh, places like Oak Bay either. Yeah. Um, the, 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 effect, the effects of any of this, because it's, uh, you know, right. it's, it's not obvious. It's not evident. It's not right. It's not right in front of them. We're going to do what we can. We'll beat the drum and we'll keep going on it. We'll keep pushing because it doesn't make sense. Again, if it's if it's our primary things, and I'm going to say it again just so that people understand, if wildfires are our biggest concern, if housing is our biggest concern, if good jobs are one of our big concerns, isn't forestry the solution? Yeah, 
yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's, uh, that, that, that sounds good. I think you should just, you should work on that full time, Jim. <laughs> well, we're fighting our own battle. We're fighting Bill C-18, where the federal government doesn't allow us to share our stuff on Facebook and Instagram. So we're fighting our own kind of uh, dystopian kind of like world here. So it's, it's kind of like stuff doesn't make sense. I think the people, again, if they walked amongst the people for a while, I think they maybe would have a different feeling, right? Like if, you know, the people came out and, and went into those communities and not just showed up for a podium thing, but actually stayed in those communities for a while and talked to the people, talked to the guy that, like, I understand the social issues too. When those people lose their jobs, it's, it's pride. And then, they, and then sometimes people um, suffer from addictions and stuff like that because it, it, it's like you took away their life's blood, right? Like their, their, their purpose too, right? So. Absolutely. And, you know, on, on your note there, it's, it's a good point, the battle, you know, you're dealing with at the same time. It's like so many of these policies, just like a lot of the policies in the, you know, in, in the forestry sector, like so many, they all sound so good. Like all, all these initiatives all sound good and they, 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 they sound innocuous, etc. But the feasibility of implementing them on the ground and the effects that it has in a you know in a market economy is not very well thought out and the effects of it the effects of it are just obvious right I like think, facts I, are stubborn things look at I, look at the job losses look at the look at the shrinking size of this industry in british columbia that's yeah. um, i think it's the stubbornness and sometimes the ego when you talk about the forestry industry when you talk about what we're facing with bill c18 we've had 38 closures of independent news outlets across Canada, lots of them downsizing and that. They won't back down from a bad policy. And it seems like the same thing there. Like it doesn't seem that they don't want to be wrong. So they just keep pushing forward and won't talk to the people that they're affecting. Right. Like they won't even talk to us about it. Right. So like, I mean, we don't matter. Wow. Right? So. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very difficult. And you always have to ask yourself about all these things is none of this seems to be good for anybody. No. Well, we'll hope for a better day, and uh, it'd be great if you just if you could send me that number. That'd be great, and maybe we'll touch base when there's some better news as well. And anytime yeah. you have something to say, let's just reach out, and we'll be glad to put it up. So, okay, that's great. Thank, thanks again for your interest, Jim. Great, you, you betcha. It. Thank you, Bruce Rose from AP Group, and uh, we thank you for watching Kelowna now. <laughs>